White Dash. He's a doctor of chicken taunting at Dumfries and Galloway University. And uh, his life story inspired the character Little Plug in the Beano. <laughs> Dr. White Dash. Quite a well-known 
uh, Scottish landscape artist. And he allegedly, Paul had been told, was a friend of the mysterious Dr. McRae and a trustee of a trust which McRae had set up to protect the films after he died. And after some reluctance, Dallas uh, agreed to see Holiday and he went in and, into his studio and this is what he told him. That there were two films in existence. He couldn't see them because of the trust and the, the conditions of the trust were that the movies weren't to be shown to anybody else. But there were three trustees, um, one of them was already dead, Sir Donald Cameron, who, although Polly doesn't say, is one of the great grand days of, of Scottish Highland society. I mean, he's one of the top clan leaders, a uh, very, very socially prominent man. Dallas and the third person who he didn't name because he was still alive. Um, and because of the conditions of the trust, there was no real way Polly was going to get to see the movies. But Dallas did agree to give him a verbal description of what they showed because there's nothing in the conditions of the trust that said he couldn't do that. And he then described um, to Holiday what he saw. Um, and what he saw was this. Um, Dr. McRae had retired, and this, this is important to just note this because this is all we know about Dr. McRae to identify who he was. He retired from London sometime in the mid 1930s. He went to live on Loch Duich, which is on the west coast of Scotland, um, on the mainland by Skye. And he'd gone to visit Loch Ness. Presumably, therefore, sometime after Loch Ness Monster came into public prominence because he, he took a movie camera with him. And he, he, he uh, had the great good luck early on to see the monster at very close range, and he managed to capture this on film at a range of about 100 yards. Um, and the film lasts for several minutes, and it shows the monster with three humps together with a neck and head uh, held low over the water, and obviously close to the shore, the, the neck's riding. A bird flies down and lands on stone in the foreground, which gives a sense of scale. And the animal is in motion, it's rolling around, you can see its flippers, um, you can see um, the skin, the tuck of leathery, and the head is, is in a sort of constant movement, muscles moving under the skin. So obviously, you're being given the impression of a film which is far more detailed, far more close up, and far more dramatic than really anything that otherwise is known to exist, supposedly showing the Loch Ness Monster. If anyone knows much about that, you'll know that there, there are four or five films in existence and most of them show sort of dark shadows on the water from quite considerable distance away. Um, the second film, which is always rather less talked about, um, show, shot uh, near Dr. McRae's home at Loch Dewey, um, shows a very similar animal, but one that uh, has a longer neck and a mane, and in that film there's a sort of this extraneous detail that somebody else appears in the background. Now, that's really the only description we have of what's in these alleged movies. Um, and Dallas went on to explain why the trust had been created. Uh, and essentially, it was because in the 1930s, at the time the movies were shot, there was a lot of ridicule, um, as it still is now, um, directed towards people who claimed to have seen the Loch Ness Monster. And Dr. McRae uh, knew a friend, prior to the Justice Abbey, who'd been ridiculed in this way, and he was anxious to avoid the, this sort of thing happening himself. And so he decided just to show the movies to some close personal friends and make sure that they would be protected and would not fall into unworthy hands after his death. Um, and at the end of Holiday's uh, interview with Dallas, Dallas also mentioned that he himself had actually seen the monster, um, quite a large one, so, uh, and uh, that uh, as an artist, the thing that struck him about it was that it was uh, iridescent, uh, which means constantly changing in colour. Um, so, The first thing we have to ask is where did Holiday get this story from? Well, it would appear he didn't literally just make it up because other people have spoken to Alistair Dallas, as I'll come on to, and he didn't, he didn't deny that he talked to Holiday. Um, the only other thing which he mentioned in his book is the date in which he uh, got this information, 27th of June 1965, and we know that he was working at the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau HQ at Akrahan at that time. So there would seem to be two possibilities. Either he picked this up from somebody else who was working for the LMPIB, which I think is unlikely because, um, as we'll come on to, nobody else working for the LMPIB seems to know the first thing about this. Or possibly he got it somewhere locally. Now, for those of you who know the geography of Loch Ness, Appenahanid is on the north shore, but at the south end of the loch, and the nearest uh, substantial village to that is Fort Augustus. So the possibility exists that if he got it from somewhere locally, he probably picked it up in Fort Augustus, rather than, say, in Vanessa, which is too far from Appenahanid to make a a sensible trip. Um, 
So when I began to investigate this back in 1995, I apologise for taking so long to put this in the public domain. I've been a bit busy writing some books for the last 10 years, and I'm finally got around to finishing it. Um, I thought that the first thing to do would be to find out from some other people who belonged to the ONPIB at that time uh, what they thought of the story, whether anybody knew anything about where Holiday had got it from, and um, how it might have come to the public domain. I wrote to Rick Heppel, who is um, sort of the keeper of the flame from the point of view of the ONPIB. He runs a thing called Nest Letter, which is a little duplicated newsletter of Rockness News. It comes out once or twice a year. Uh, and he knows more than probably anybody about the people involved in that phase of the search for the monster. And um, so I got a letter back from Rick saying, as you can see there, that he used to spend a lot of time trawling with locals for information, and that's possibly how word of the McRae films reached him. And although when, this, when he published his book on uh, the Loch Ness monster, people at the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau discussed this amongst themselves, nobody had really taken the investigation any further. They thought the holiday had gone as far as he could. And then I phoned Roy Mackle, uh, another author who wrote a book about Loch Ness and was one of the scientific uh, honchos at the LNPIB. And he said pretty much the same thing. Holiday spent a lot of time with the locals and picked up a lot of gossip. Uh, and that beyond that, really, not much else had been done to investigate the story. He thought David James, um, who was the head of the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau, might have possibly tried to look into ways of getting the film seen, but nothing had really happened. Um, one of the other things that Mackle mentioned to me in this phone conversation was that nobody really pursued it much further because at that time, with these cameras that the Loch Ness Bureau had dotted around the shore, they were all completely convinced that they were going to come up with their own definitive film any second. Uh, that was 40 odd years ago and it hasn't happened yet. So nobody was too bothered because they thought well, they would solve the mystery themselves. So my first thought was well, what did Holiday say about where he got this uh, movie from? Uh, and, and what Dr. McRae had, uh, had done so of his trust. But he said that the prior of Fort Augustus Abbey was one of Dr. McRae's friends. So my personal guess, and it can be no more than that, is that maybe the story came out of Fort Augustus Abbey, which at that time had 15 or 20 months in a boarding school of boys as well attached to it. Uh, and if he didn't get it from the prior of Fort Augustus Abbey, he might have got it from somebody who knew the prior or knew one of the monks who talked to the prior. And that's the most likely, in my personal opinion, the most likely way that the story might have seeped into the public consciousness. Okay, so that's as far as I got by 1995, but as an historian, one of the things you, you, you get a, a knowledge of is sources of information, and it struck me almost immediately that a doctor ought to be relatively easy to research because as public um, figures, they are tend to be fairly well attested to in various records. You can find them quite easily in censuses, street directories, phone books, and particularly in this rather wonderful publication the Medical Register, which lists every doctor who has qualified um, in the UK. And it gives them basic information about them. It gives their name, it gives the place where they study, the date in which they were registered as a doctor, and it gives their home address rather easily. So, if Dr. McRae filmed this movie in the mid 1930s, and that's the closest date we've got, the earliest it could reasonably have been taken would be 1933, because that's the earliest date in which Loch Ness stories were published in the press. And so I decided to start by checking the medical register from 1933 and making a list of all the Dr. McCrae's that were in it. And there they are. There's 36 of them. But one of those guys, if there was a Dr. McCrae, is almost certainly the Dr. McCrae we're looking for. And if you remember, the only thing we know about him is he had been in London, he'd retired to the Highlands, and he lived on Loch Derrick, supposedly. So to try and narrow that down by using the information in the medical register, well, first of all, you can take out the women, who aren't very many of them in the 1930s, and then, by using the date in which the doctor's qualified, and make some assumptions about what sort of age you are normally when you qualify as a doctor, sometime in your early 20s, roughly, you can then say, well, who, which of these doctors would have retired by around about 1933? And you can knock out an awful lot of them that way, because in fact, when you do that, you're left with four. Donald McRae in London, lived in the east end of London. He was 88 at the time, so he was a bit, a bit old to be not retired yet to the Highlands of Scotland. And John Lewis McRae, although his name is listed as a doctor in London, actually was working for an international medical consultancy and wasn't in the UK at that time. And that leaves us with the two Farco McRae's. One in Allness. Allness is a very small town on uh, the east coast of Scotland, uh, my Firth area. And Dr. Farco McRae of Rattigan. And that immediately made me well because if you look at a map of the west coast of Scotland, this here is Loch Dewey, and here is a tiny settlement called Rattigan. Uh, it's only about six houses, so pretty definitely it would appear that um, Dr. McRae of Rattigan 
is almost certainly the person to whom Paul Day was talking, uh, uh, referring. He uh, talked about a doctor who had worked in London and retired to the shores of Loch Derrick. So it would appear that we can actually identify Dr. McRae, the mysterious movie maker, from the medical register of the 1930s. Um, and using the sources I mentioned earlier, we can then start to piece together a little bit about Dr. McRae's life by using street directories, censuses, the medical directory itself, which often lists the places where people were working. Uh, and you can gradually start to piece it together and fill in a few of these little gaps. And you end up with a little skeleton of his life, which looks like this. Born in Loch in 1855, qualified, or John, sorry, started work uh, as a, a medical student at the University of Aberdeen in 1884, which is when he was 29. And I would imagine that that indicates, that we'll see later, he came from quite a big family. Um, an attempt by his family to save up enough money to make him uh, able to study. Uh, once he qualified as a Bachelor of Medicine in 1888, he went to work for Rio Tinto Zinc. Um, I got some interesting information from the archivist there about his, his uh, salary and the job he'd done. He worked as a medical officer in a copper mine in Spain for about 18 months. But he didn't like the job, obviously, because in 1889 he's back in Lewis in the Hebrides living with his brother. And then in 1892 he pops down to London. He's obviously decided that he's going to make a better career for himself um, in the centre of the British Empire than up in Scotland. And his first surgery is in Newgate Street, EC, which is it's not the East End, but it's the east side of the city of London. So a uh, sort of modest original address. And he moves quite quickly from there. By 1896, he's joined the BMA. In 1897, he's living in Half Moon Street in Mayfair, which is a very posh address indeed. And by 1899, uh, 1899, in Belgravia. And if you consult the Belgravia Street Director for that year, you will see his next door neighbours at that time were a vice admiral on one side and um, uh, a judge on the other. So he socially very rapidly becomes a very prominent guy. Um, in, 18, in 1903, he does uh, a one year stint at the Golden Square Throat Hospital, which was the primary facility for throat uh, diseases in London at that time. And I would guess that he was there, he was there for only a year, and I would guess that's because he needed to have a qualification for having worked at that particular prominent establishment so that he could be more successful in private practice, which he returned to in 1904. In 1905, um, he put in a note in the medical directory saying he could send telegrams to him at Tullochard. Now that's an interesting little detail because Tullochard is um, a Gaelic air, quite a well-known one, and a, and a Tullochard in Gaelic is a signal beacon, which he would use in the Highlands for sending warnings of um, uh, attacks by your enemies. And so he started to build up a picture of this guy. He's a Highlander. I mean, he's a proud Highlander, a Gale, and he's, he's very proud of his heritage and of the history of the Highlands. You can see that again at the bottom in 1925, Selma, Rattigan, that's, he bought a house, a, a property in Rattigan, and he renamed it Selma. Selma is the name of the palace in which uh, Fingal lives in the poems of Ossian. And that is also slightly um, interesting because the poems of Ossian, which is a sort of Gaelic epic, um, were published in the 1700s and were quickly exposed by none other than Dr. Johnson as a fraud committed by um, a Highland poet who claimed to have found his ancient poems. And it became quite a major scandal. So for a, a Gaelic guy uh, in 1920s to use uh, a reference from the poems of Ossian um, when they've been so comprehensively discredited, again, sort of points, I think, to somebody who was a, a very proud Gael and, and sort of rejected the idea that these Southerners had that the, the poems are worthless because they were a hoax. In uh, between 1905 and 1920, he's a prominent doctor in London. He doesn't often list where he is, but uh, he seems to be in private practice in London. In 1920, he returned to the Highlands, not the 1930s, as Holder was told. He goes to Edin Bay, which is a new hospital on the Island of Skye. He's the head of, uh, of that medical establishment for five years. And then in, there's a note in the medical director in 1925 saying he's retired. So in 1925, he retires, as Holder was told, uh, to Rattigan on the shores of Loch Dewey. Um, he lives on a pretty long time. In 1940, he pops up in Inverness because all the various doctors who were working at the local family medical practice and the Cray Medical Practice in Inverness had all gone off to war, so he was helping there. And he eventually dies in Inverness at the age of 92 in 1948. So the one other thing we can put into this little grid of Dr. McCray's life, of course, is that um, 1935, roughly, he films the Loch Ness Monster, supposedly. Now, of course, it's worth pointing out that he's born in 1855, so he's 80 years old when this happens, which I don't think is how people imagined it when they heard it at the OMPIB in the 1960s. It's um, uh, not necessarily particularly doggedly 80-year-old, but a guy of 80, nevertheless, who's 
sort of you know, sprinting across the heaven to get his camera on the monster, but it doesn't quite fit. But that's roughly how old he would have been had he shot any movies of the Loch Ness Monster or C7. Okay. So I've mentioned some of the more boring sources for Dr. McRae's life. There's one that's just slightly more interesting, which is The History of the Clan McRae, published in 1899 by Alexander McRae. And we can be fairly sure that what this says about Dr. McRae is pretty accurate, because Alexander McRae, the author, was his brother, his younger brother. Um, and from that, we can pick up the fact that um, he was the son of a man called uh, James McRae, known as Seamus Dan, uh, James the Fair, that is in Gaelic, who was an early Gaelic songwriter, um, second youngest of seven children, and he was a noted collector of McRae family tradition and an enthusiastic Gael, which I've already mentioned was a deduction I had made. Um, and this we can pick up from um, the history of the family McRae, and I'm sorry to get out of focus. It's his family tree. Uh, it's not particularly important to know, but this is his, his line of brothers. He's the second youngest, that's Dr. McRae there. Um, he is unmarried, doesn't have any children himself, but um, various of his family do, uh, particularly here, his older brother John McRae had a number of children who stayed largely in the uh, Mock Duick area. Um, I'll come back to this family tree later on, and I'm sorry for being out of focus, but I'll point out one or two other important facts about it as we get to it. Okay, so my next step was to try and find a little bit more about him as a person than one could just get from books. And I got hold of a copy of the Harlem and Dunham's phone directory and discovered that only one McRae was actually living in Rattigan at the time I was doing this research, which is in the mid 1990s. So I wrote to Finley McRae in Rattigan, and to my pleasure, got back a letter from this guy, Jack McRae, who was a relative um, who was also interested in family history. And Finley McRae had obviously passed the letter on to Jack McRae. I had a bit of a correspondence with him um, about the late Dr. Farker. Uh, who he remembered because Jack McRae was a, 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 at school in the Loch Duke area in the 1940s when uh, Farker McRae was still living there. And he gave me a little bit of this family background. Um, and the key points to note here are um, he was an ear, nose, and throat specialist, who could have also presumably deduced from his um, apprenticeship at the Throat Hospital, a specialist in Harley Street, which of course you know is quite the poshest place in London for doctors, and that ties in with the idea of him being socially quite prominent as does the fact that he was second in shot in line for a royal appointment. He didn't get it, but he would have been the next guy for the first bloke who turned it down. Um, he lived in a fairly comfortable start of the area at the time. Because he was unmarried, he had housekeepers. He took in a border, but even the border was uh, a very wealthy guy, known locally as the millionaire, Amy Rayner, um, who had a ghillie and a, a driver. So we're not talking about somebody who's sort of crossed on the social scale here. In fact, he kept aloof from the local folk, mixing mostly with landowners and ministers. Uh, and he saw his family in the area, um, his nephew, also Dr. Parker McRae, who's now dead. And at the time I was writing, uh, doing this original research, his widow, Doc, that's the second the nephew's widow, Dr. Mary McRae was still alive, she's dead now, as are most of the people. I was glad I did this in 1998. If I tried to do it now, it would have been too late. Um, and then they had themselves, so the grand nephews of the McRae were interested in uh, working in Loch Alston and Dr. Now, this was the next thing that Jack McRae told me. Um, what had happened was, at this point, I had carefully not mentioned my interest in the Loch Ness Monster to anybody because I didn't want to send anyone running scared of these weirdos. Um, and I had merely sort of dropped some broad hints about his hobby of wildlife photography in the hope that, that might get some people going, but it didn't. Um, but simultaneously, by one of these sort of 14 coincidences, a guy called Paul Harrison turned out to be working on the same subject. Paul was working in, on the Encyclopedia of the Loch Ness Monster at this time. He was mainly a Jack the Ripper expert, but he decided to write some books about cryptozoology, and he started looking for the, um, the uh, same story, but in a sort of much more direct way of mine. He'd actually just written a letter to the Inverness Courier saying, does anybody know anything about the McRae films? And this happened at the same time as I was corresponding with Jack McRae, and suddenly, uh, in his second letter to me, uh, we get this thing, a rumour has appeared in Inverness that Dr. Fark and McRae have made a film of Loch Ness Monster. And Dr. Mary, who, as I say, is the wife of McRae's great nephew, makes life the room that I wouldn't worry much about it. Um, I then wrote to Paul Harrison and we decided to pull resources. And as it turns out, it was quite a good thing we did because we'd been pursuing completely separate lines of inquiry and they dovetailed quite nicely. And one of the things that happened was that Paul Harrison then got some letters from the Inverness medical side of the McRae family. This is Dr. Malcolm McRae, who is another grand nephew of Parker McRae. Um, and his wife had written to Paul. And he got a letter from the wife, Fiona McRae, 
with some basic family information, telling us where you're buried. Um, I've heard a story about photographs, not film, that he'd taken of the Loch Ness Monster, but I know nothing about their whereabouts. So, of course, Paula immediately wrote back to find out if she knew any more information at all about this, and she responded, Farquhar McRae was a cousin of my husband's grandfather, and as far as we remember, the film photo story came from his uncle, who died about 30 years ago. That's all I know. So, we've got a little bit further then. There are two members of the family, if we summarise briefly, who've told us a bit. Firstly, Mary McRae had said she doesn't believe a word of it, and second, and Pierre McRae is another generation further down the family tree, has heard some vague story, but so vague she's not even sure if it's a uh, photograph or a movie. I mean, she says she thinks it's a photograph, I wouldn't take that necessarily as, as gospel, it might just be that she's heard a vague story and hasn't remembered it properly. Uh, it's not necessarily that the face taking pictures, not really, it could be either way. Okay, so at that point I persuaded my family that the thing, right thing to do was go on holiday to the Highlands, which they cursed me for because it for two solid weeks. I went up to Loch Duke and I got a few family snapshots. That's Selma, the house in which Dr. McRae lived in Rattigan. Uh, and then I went over the other side of the lot to the grave side. And those are the McRae family graves. Uh, this one here is Dr. Duncan McRae, who is his nephew. Uh, this is his um, older brother. And this is the grave of Parker McRae himself. And although you can't see it, that's the very close up. This is his inscription here. It's in Gaelic, which is another plank in the whole crowd. Gaelic, baby eyes building up. All the rest of the family monuments are in English, which is enough. Okay, I wanted then to find out, I, I thought, you know, I know a fair bit about this guy now, I've got a picture of him, but I haven't physically, I don't know anything about how he looked, and I had to leave it there, because I tried the McRae family, I went to the Gesto Hospital in Edinburgh in Sky, I'm not trying to say I might have one, and I also tried the University of Aberdeen, who might have a like, matriculation photograph or something, nobody had anything. Um, and I left it there for 10 years, and when I decided to come down and talk to you guys, I thought I'd better have another look. Um, and one of my favourite methods of research, and I commend this to anybody who doesn't use it at the moment, is a fantastic new project called Google Books. And basically Google are visually scanning every single book that's ever been printed, and um, put it running them through an optical character recognition system, which means that they are then effectively indexing the entire libraries of the Western world, they're going to do some of the Eastern ones now as well. Uh, they're doing this in conjunction with various major universities. And one of the things that they, fortunately for me, turn out to digitise is Celtic Monthly, which I've never even heard of. But if you go to Google Books, you have to go to it, especially it's not part of Google, you go to, um, there's a, a button which sort of gives you other Google search engines that comes up under that. It's enormously worthwhile. I use it for my Spring Hill Jack research as well. It gives new material almost every month or two months. So Celtic Monthly, as it turns out, um, was a publication at the turn of the last century which um, liked to give little profiles and photographs of Keen Gales, so pe people who were bringing up Highland tradition and maintaining it. And, they, and one of the people they managed to do a profile of in volume 7, 1899, page 76, was Farco McRae. Um, so we now have a photograph, we know what he looked like. Try and get this to come up. There we go. That is the guy who allegedly took these two amazing movies, and we now know what he sounds like. Now, another one of my less successful research techniques is that whenever I come across a new search engine, I also make a, a point of entering the names of the various topics I'm busily researching. I usually have about half a dozen research projects on the go. And shortly after I found that photograph, I was searching through the British Sound Archive, and I thought, well, just do my usual thing. I'll put in everybody's name. And I must say, of all my 25 years of research, um, this was one of my most jaw-hitting-the-floor moments, because it turns out that Dr. Farquhar McRae, the guy who was a myth, effectively, until I started this research, and about whom we now know so much, he not only has a photograph of him, but in 1908, um, he made a series of wax cylinder recordings of Gaelic folk songs uh, for an ethnologist with the unlikely name of Lucy Ethelred Beard. <laughs> and these wax cylinders still exist in the British Sound Archive, and in fact they're in amazingly good condition, because absolutely nobody's interested in Gaelic folk songs because they've not been played very much. Between now and then, and so um, Dave, we can have a quick listen to Dr. Farkin, as well as looking at him, and hear what he sounds like too. <laughs> 
they must have virtually disintegrated, they probably um, explode into flame the moment they open the can. So I wrote off to the uh, National Museum of Photography, Film and Television to ask about this, and discovered this is actually a bit of an urban myth, that in fact, in the 1930s, um, cellulose nitrate was, had been phased out, it was really only used even before that for silent black and white movies. And that most films shot on um, private film stock in the 1930s were shot on cellulose. And although that would not necessarily be in brilliant condition, it certainly might well still be viewable if we could find it today. So um, it was also um, allegedly locked in a private vault. Now, one of Paul Harrison's big bugbears about all this was the idea that if that's the case, it, it shows the movies can't exist because somebody has to be paying for these private vaults and he couldn't find anybody having talked to as many relatives on every side as he could, who would admit to knowing anything about private ports. But in fact, again, that's a bit of an urban myth. Although there are private ports like that, you also have large vaults in most major city banks where things can sit for ages. And about four or five years ago, there was a story in the what, 200 years, um, without anybody paying for them. So you don't necessarily have to rule out the existence of these movies just because nobody's paying for a private vault. The next question, of course, is who actually has access, and the only realistic people uh, who might have access to the movies are either the trustees that um, McRae, uh, the trust that McRae is supposed to set up for, or the people they appointed to succeed them when they die, or McRae's heirs. So, um, now this is another little known fact that historians know and not many other people do, and I, you might want to watch out for the wills are in fact public documents, and after you've written the will, it goes to a public uh, records office, and anybody who wants to get hold of a copy can in fact send off, and they will send you a photocopy of this person's will. And this is the will of Dr. McRae, which I got from the Scottish Records Office, just on the off chance he might have mentioned, I took these two amazing movies in the 1930s, and here's what I've done with them. Now sadly, although the will is six pages long, and it lists a large number of uh, bequests and a large number of shares of the guy who was pretty wealthy. He was worth about £13,000 in 1944, which is a fair bit of money in those days. Uh, the will says nothing whatsoever about the disposition or even the existence of any movies. I also checked the will as Donald Cameron, another blank, and I tried to find the will of Alistair Dallas, but although the Scottish Records Office and the Edinburgh Commissary Court ought to hold it, they don't. So it appears that Alistair Dallas may well have died in testate. Uh, so none of the three trustees, the two trustees we know about, made any reference in their will to passing on a trust, to setting up a, another uh, trustee to take their place, or to um, disposing of the films. And Farquhar McRae did not leave the films to anybody. Um, he, left, he divided his estate amongst seven relatives, but none of the uh, things he left uh, in the will were movies, they were all just shares and so on. So that was a bit of a blank. Um, and I then moved on to the first peculiar wrinkle in this whole story, which is Alistair Dallas, the guy who gave us all of this information essentially. Holiday only the room that films exist, all the material we have about the McVeigh films really, the details of what they show, the fact that there's a trust supposedly and so on, all come from Alistair Dallas. So it seemed well worth finding out a bit more about him as well. Uh, and this is what I discovered. Um, born in Berlin, that's just because his parents were passing through pretty much, educated in Edinburgh, he served as a, on the Western Front in the Great War as a lieutenant. Um, and then travelled quite widely, became a commercial artist and a full-time artist from 1932. Not successful enough to make a living out of it because he was working in the Loch Ness area for five years between 1932 and 1937 and he supported himself by working part-time in the youth hostel. Now, you might just want to stop for one moment here and say to yourself, Dr. McRae, Keen Gale, socially enormously eminent, mixes only with ministers and that's chiefs of Highland clans. And one of his trustees is this commercial artist who's working in a youth hostel. Dr. McRae is 80 and this guy is 35. And I can't, for the life of me, work out quite how Alistair Dallas would ever have become such a good friend of Dr. McRae that he would have wanted to make him a trustee out of one of the three of the trustees of this um, extremely important trust he set up to protect his movies. But that's by the by. I, I, I mean, they may, maybe they had lots of shared interests, but it did seem a bit unusual to me. Particularly when I found out that when uh, Dallas served in the Merchant Navy in World War II, this was not as an officer of uh, some sort of large um, tanker supporting Britain. He worked as a cook on a Panamanian registered ferry uh, working between Panama and Colombia, uh, well out of the, uh, any uh, danger of getting himself killed. And then he went back after the war to cut right where he lived and supported himself as an artist until he died in 1983. 
So if we go back to um, Roy McCall's book, which is one of the very few, apart from holidays, that mentions them in great films, we find that he wrote this. The problem with these films is complicated by the fact that Holiday's account is, according to Alan Wilkins, disputed by Dallas himself. Wilkins recently interviewed Dallas who reports basic discrepancies in the story. There's no trust, there's only one film, the one that shot on the west coast of Scotland, uh, not two, and Dallas does not know where it is. That's really the only other bit of information we've got about this whole information from previously published sources. So I asked myself who Alan Wilkins might be, because so obviously I wanted to speak to him. Matt Powell is actually the only person who mentions him. And when I spoke to Warren Mackle on the phone, he said that he'd never spoken to Wilkins directly, got this information about what Wilkins had got out of Dallas by speaking to Ted Holliday. Um, and I assumed from this that probably that meant that Alan Wilkins himself was a member of the LNPIB, Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau. So I wrote again to Rip Heppel, and Rip gave me a 24 year old address for Alan Wilkins, which I wrote to, and by an enormous piece of fortune, he hadn't moved. He was still there, and he was still alive in 1998. Sadly, he's died since. Um, and I got a very, very helpful letter from him. This is the one I want you to photocopy, John, because it's really important, and I'm probably the only person who's got a copy now. I don't want it to go missing. Um, now, Wilkins conducted his research in 1974, and Dallas would not speak to him. Dallas would, however, speak to one of Wilkins' friends, and I called Tom Skinner, because Skinner had a friend who was a friend of Dallas. It was very fortunate. And Skinner was also very fortunately a biologist who's the head of biology at Annan Academy, which is a moderately well-known Scottish public school. So Skinner went off and did an interview with Alistair Dallas, and he also got two letters from him, which I have in my files, and I'll give to John and the CSF files as well, because they're quite interesting, and they give us a lot more information. So this is what Tom Skinner got out of Alistair Dallas in the 1970s. McRae, as we already know, I think, is a retired Harley Street surgeon. He repeated the fact that there was only one movie, not two, in existence. This is a Loch Derrick movie. And also, if you remember, at the beginning, Holiday was told that these are two very clear films. Well, Dallas then contradicted this and said, Actually, the film is amateurish and not clear. The bird which came down was the buzzard. Now, I presume it probably means an osprey, because I don't know that the buzzard is sort of American, it's kind of American, isn't it? But uh, a large bird. Um, and he then went on and, and said, you know, he was quite agitated about this. Holiday's description of the Loch Ness film that McRae shot was actually a distorted description of Dallas's own sighting of the Loch Ness monster, which had taken place in September 1926. Um, and this is what Dallas said, this is a quote from the letter he wrote to Tom Skinner. Only one fine moment. It's my personal knowledge is reporting this conversation with me is almost diametrically opposed to facts. I was there, so I do know about that. There was no suggestion on my part of the second film. The first I heard of that was your information. I don't want to press the button too many times in case you shoot forward. Thank you. 
which is probably about the best you're going to get to seeing what someone who's very complex is there. And I want an access to more, excuse me, further bit of description. Um, but there are three dorsal fins, I believe you said. Turn the card in a second. Maybe. This is currently a slightly unlikely animal, incidentally, of course, because. There you go. Three dorsal fins like sharks, thick, fleshy, and flabby, a tail in the water, mangy appearance with tufts of hair and fibre. He's sketched out from above a three-quarter side view. Next slide, go forward one. Um, conical head, rather like half a rubber ball, two horn-like sense organs, one of those things you often hear rumoured about the Loch Ness monster. So, a bristly mane, stiff yet flexible, slit-like eyes, three humps, the neck is held low over the water and seems to be riding to and fro. This is all the description of, of what Holiday said about the uh, McRae films, and you can see the connection between them and what Dallas was then describing as his own sighting. And there are obviously some fairly obvious connections between them. <coughs> the Holiday book says three humps. Dallas is sighting as a of Tom Skinner, so it's three dorsal fins. They both mention a forward flipper, distinctive flipper. Um, Holiday says a bristling mane, and Dallas says tufts of hair. And the only real difference is the eyes, although, in fact, as, as Skinner pointed out, depending on what angle you see eyes from, they can look both round and slit like if uh, you see them from the side or the front. And this, although it's not a very good scan, is the little picture that Alice Dallas drew in 1974. And you can see the monster sucking away at this rock. This thing here, T, will come on this again in a minute. He said it looked like a sort of goat's bottle. Uh, it has these round eyes, the distinctive flipper, and the dorsal fins, and then the tail at the bottom in the water. Now, after he'd spoken to Tom Skinner, Dallas went back to his um, art studio and he managed to find the original photo, uh, photos, original pictures he drew in the 1930s. He's had them made into a, um, a photo lipo plate and he sent a copy of this to Skinner, who passed it to Wilkins, who passed it to the Loch Ness Criminal Investigation Bureau, who filed it in Drum the Rocket, where it's now part of the archives of the official Loch Ness Monster Exhibition. And, uh, I wrote to Adrian Shine, who runns the Loch Ness Project, who I know, and he got Dick Rayner, another guy who's been long involved in Loch Ness, to go and dig it out. So he managed to get, eventually to find uh, what Alistair Dallas had um, originally drawn in 1936. I can't swear to you that Dallas didn't go back and do this in 1974, of course, but he said that this was the original. And I'll leave it to the scientists in the audience to explain just how biologically unlikely this thing actually is, because it's got ears, so it's a mammal, presumably. Um, it's also got dorsal fins, several of them, which is not particularly uh, likely. It's got these weird sort of bottle things here. Um, and then it's got this very highly adapted, by the look of it, um, mouth for sucking weeds off rocks. Now, if you think that a 32-foot-long mammal can support itself by sucking weeds off rocks on the shores of Loch Ness, you are more of an optimist than I am, because I don't think that biologically, and then geologically, this thing could realistically exist. But this is what Dallas said. So you do have to ask the question, how reliable a witness is Alistair Dallas? And Alan Wilkins told me he was known in cut by an eccentric. And Alistair Dallas Jr., his son, told me, and he was, you know, he, had a, he was slightly embarrassed about this. My father was a great teller of tales. He wasn't exactly a deliberate liar, but he very much liked attention. And Dallas went on to say that he didn't know anything about this movie, he didn't know anything about any vault that it could be kept in, he didn't know anything about trustees, he didn't even know that his father had any friends called Dr. McRae. He had no idea how the story came from. Um, so we're looking at something which is allegedly three minutes of film, authenticity confirmed by Kodak, which I have to say is kind of such, such a common thing. You see, it's almost a folk or motif in cryptology. Kodak can't find anything wrong with these movies. Um, and lawyers are looking to get these films released. And that is the last you hear of it. The Aberdeen Evening Express never did a follow up, nobody else did a follow up. Nick Witchell noted the story and wrote about it in his book um, on Loch Ness, and it sort of seeped into the cryptozoological consciousness as a result. But uh, nothing more has ever been found out about the Kelly films or the um, mysterious investigator who first wrote about them. Third wrinkle of the whole thing the second movie that McRae's supposed to have shot. If we believe Alistair Dallas, this is the only movie that McRae shot. And it's one of these peculiarities of the whole subject that, I mean, Apart from that, the whole story has been very badly researched. The people who research have all been Loch Ness monster researchers. seem to have absolutely no interest, weirdly enough, in the idea of movies of sea serpents. Now, I'm interested in Loch Ness, so nobody's really looked at the second movie at all. Um, and 
Only if you're someone like me who used to spend his school days um, at the boarding school when you had to go off and do your homework for an hour in this classroom and you ran out of time and you needed something to do. I used to, my way of filling the time was I had a copy of Hoyberg's in the wake of the sea serpents. I used to go through it and draw out all the pictures. For years, I don't want two years of it. This so I had a complete set of pictures because it was a library book. I wasn't allowed to keep it and I wanted my own copies. And as a result, I had a sort of fetishist knowledge of what Hoyberg's reported as the sort of the definitive list of sea serpent cases. And I knew. Immediately, that I've seen the name of what we before, because there are actually two or three other sea serpent sightings from this area, uh, and they are worth looking at. So, just have a closer look at what we It's five miles long, a mile wide. It's famous only because it's got Eileen Dolan Castle, and you've all seen pictures of this that beautiful castle right down the shore that sticks out into the lake, and it's one of the sort of iconic pictures of the Highlands. And it's linked to the sea by the Kyle of and the sign of Sleet. And I apologise for the poor quality of the map. This is what we're here. As I say, that's Raskin, where Dr. McVeigh lived. That's Eileen Dunn Castle. Uh, but we're going to look at a couple of sightings now. One of them took place in San Sleep, up the side of the uh, mainland where it joins the sky, and the other in the Kyla Loch Alsh, which is this area here. Loch Alsh is the sea loch just inside there, which leads straight into Loch Duric. So if we could just bear that geography in mind. Uh, the first of them, of course, the Hogan's mentions, dates to 1872, a little cutter called the Leader. Uh, and it, it was a sea serpent reported by two people, Reverend McRae and Tugany. Now, Reverend McRae, we know from Alexander McRae's history of the Clan McRae, was a very, very distant relative of Parker McRae. He's a second or third cousin once removed. And Tugany came from Kent. They were sailing this boat um, up Sand Street, and they saw at 100 yards range a head and neck low on the water, and there were a series of humps. I'm quite surprised that the leader story isn't better known, actually, because it's one of the, the most um, remarkable sea serpent stories, mainly because of this extremely unusual duration. They sail up the lock one day, um, the sand of sleep, so it's a sea lock effectively, um, and this monster accompanied them most of the way, and then they sail back the other day and they saw it again. There were several people on board the boat as well, so apart from these two reverends, there were the two daughters of one of them, um, a nephew and a highland lad. Um, and one of the girls was so scared by this animal that she actually insisted on being landed on the shore of Glenelg, and she walked home 13 miles in the middle of the night, just at 2.30 in the morning, she was landed across rough highland tracks, so she was pretty really scared by it. And um, that's what they saw. That's, so that's day one, a sort of line of humps and a head, and that's day two, a sort of shallow series of humps. There were had more sightings in Loch Duke the previous year, and again in 1872, a local got man called Alexander McMillan made two reports of seen four half rounds and a monster about 60 to 80 feet long in Loch Duric itself. And then, in 1893, in the Clyde of Loch Alsh, which you'll remember is the uh, narrow channel joining the sea to Loch Alsh and then onto Loch Duric, Dr. Farker Matheson and his wife saw a long, straight, neck-like thing as tall as my mast. They were in another boat, a little boat, so probably about 8 to 10 feet out of the water, brown in colour, at a range of 200 yards. And they also had several sightings, four of them, two minutes duration, and Farker Matheson said he thought it was a saurian, some sort of reptile, in other words. His son, who was contacted by Rupert Gould years later, rather less charitably, said it might have been a whirlwind. But um, that's the picture which appeared in the Strand magazine in 1895, um, allegedly showing what Farker Matheson saw. We don't know how accurate that is because there's no evidence that the artist talked to Farker Matheson about it at all. But again, it's quite an iconic picture. You, a lot of people who know about sea serpent will have seen that picture. Now, of course, the next thing. Yeah. Who was Farker Matheson? Um, a doctor born in 1840 on Loch Alsh, died in 1905. Practised in Soho Square and was, according to his son, one of the earliest specialists in diseases of the ear, nose, and throat. And he was also, according to his obituary in the Times, the president of the Gate Society of London. Now, if I haven't put all of you to sleep, there should be some alarm bells ringing by now because mm -hmm. we'll recognise some of these things. Ear, nose, and throat, Gaelic. Uh, okay, he's 15 years older than Farker Matheson. But um, I thought it was worth looking into this a little bit more. Loch Alch, which is the parish that Farker Matheson and Farker McRae were both born in, has a population of 2,700 in 1889. And from that little parish, you have two doctors, both of them specialists in the diseases of the ear, nose, and throat, both of them keen gales, both of them socially successful and practicing in London. And I mentioned earlier I'd come back to Farker McRae and his sudden success in London. I mean, this is just a personal guess, I can't prove this at all. But if you ask how could a doctor from Loch Alsh appear in London and within six years be practicing um, in Mayfair and Belgravia, he must have had somebody there introducing him to the right sort of people, and I think it's possible, although I certainly can't prove it, that Dr. 
Patterson, who came from the same parish, might have been the person doing this. But I, I certainly find it impossible to believe that these two guys did not know of each other. Particularly when I then contacted the current secretary of the Gaelic Society of London and discovered that Farquhar McRae succeeded Farquhar Madsen as the president of the Gaelic Society of London. Now, sadly for me, this is one of the things that's, that really bums me out about being a conscientious historian. I actually got Joyce Seymour Chalk to go through their minute books and I got her to list every single meeting that Farquhar McRae had been to, and on none of them was he there at the same time as Farquhar Madsen, sadly. But I do think that there's a very high probability indeed. That Farquhar Matson and Farquhar uh, McRae knew each other. Particularly when I discovered that Farquhar Matson is buried, and again, I'm going to on, that is Farquhar Matson's gravestone, and that church is Kirkston, which you remember is the place where Farquhar McRae is buried. And I hadn't actually made this connection when I went up in 1998 to uh, Lockbury, and I'm one of these guys who loves looking at old grave inscriptions, and I went up to this grave, which you would do because it's the biggest one in the churchyard to find out whose it was. 25 yards of Parker and McRae's, and when I saw whose grave it was, and I have to say, I staggered backwards in amazement. The only time I've ever done that in my entire career as a 14, I staggered back in amazement to realise these two guys are very so close together. So I don't know what that means. I mean, I have to say, I think it means something. Did Farquhar McRae know about Farquhar Matheson's much earlier sighting? Was he, did that make him more likely to look out on Loch Duick and, and think there might be something there? Was it making him more likely to misinterpret something he sees on Loch Duick as a sea serpent? Is he jealous of Farquhar Matheson and his sighting and wants to have one of his own? I mean, you can take your pick, but I just find it something, the fact that these two guys have a connection must mean something. I don't know what it is. I'll leave it to you to guess. So, in summary, what have we got here? Well, we've got a very unreliable witness, Alison Dallas. He's changed his story. One film, two films. There is a trust, there isn't a trust. I saw the monster, Farquhar McRae saw the monster. Not a great underpinning for um, the you know, suggesting that there may be something in this story. The whole business of what sort of information there is is, is peculiar. We know something else, I didn't mention this earlier particularly, but um, the idea of a bank vault, we know from Farquhar McRae's will now where he banked. He banked with the Bank of Scotland and he uh, made his will when he was living in Edinburgh. So if it's in a bank vault anywhere, I commend to you the Bank of Scotland in Edinburgh. That would be the first place I'd look. Um, and then we have the whole list of where Hall they got the story from. But when he got to Alistair Dallas, Alistair Dallas didn't say, I don't know anything about this. And when we spoke to Alistair Dallas' son, and when Wilkins spoke to Alistair Dallas, they didn't say, Holiday came to me with this mad story and I indulged him, but it's all made up. Alistair Dallas did seem to suggest that there was something in the story. He confirmed that he knew something called Dr. McRae. Um, and of course, there's this, I don't know if you noticed this, but there's this tiny glimmer of hope in the family tradition. Do you remember what Fiona McRae told Paul Harrison and myself? Uh, she said, we got the story from an uncle who died in the 1960s. Now, I apologise, this doesn't come up well enough for to read it. But the only uncle who died in the 1960s is this guy here, Dr. Duncan McRae, the big doctor. He was the medical officer for the Nell, which is that whole area, uh, on Loch Duke for 50 years until he died in 1962. And we know from Farquhar McRae's will that he was actually the member of the family to whom he was closest, because he actually says here, uh, when he's making his request, the top guy in the list is Dr. Duncan McRae, the big doctor, who gets a thousand pounds right off the top. The other uh, members of the family have to divide it all up um, between them. And uh, he actually mentions him as getting this particularly munificent request. In grateful memory of my father, his father, my brother, John McRae, in providing a home, and in providing a home for me when I was homeless, and in recognition of Dr. McRae's own assiduous and more than nebulae medical attendance since I first came to Vatican. So, if Fiona McRae and her husband got the story of the McRae films from Dr. Duncan McRae, and if Dr. Duncan McRae knew Dr. Farquhar McRae particularly well, and if these stories were communicated through the McRae clan in the, before Dr. McRae died in 1962, they must predate what Ted Holliday found out. And so I find, you know, and mostly when I come to the conclusion of investigation, that being the skeptic that I am, I, to my own satisfaction, completely demolished all possibility that there's anything in it. But I have to say, in this one case, there is some possibility that there's some sort of photograph, some sort of movie might exist showing sea serpent, in the very common scene, not do it, uh, and that, that might be totally independent of what Ted Holliday and his GBS informant, Al Sadan, have said. Um, and it might show nothing more than the deer drowning on the shores of Loch Doom, but I do think there's some possibility that some sort of photograph shot film that exists. And on that note, it's then worth looking at how can we possibly get hold of this thing? Well, according to Dallas, 
there was a trust. Um, nobody had looked into this, but there are, in fact, some very specific laws that govern trusts, um, which are worth noting here. A trust must have a living human beneficiary, and the court will hold it void if there's no beneficiary to come to request that it's enforced. Uh, a trust must be conceptually certain, which means that there has to be a clear way of testing whether its conditions are actually met. We must not offend against the rule on perpetuities. It can't be one that goes on forever. This comes from a, an 18th century case where somebody invested some money to be in the benefit of their great, 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 great grandson. Um, and a court found it was illegal to do this because it, it was just too far in the future. And it, um, it's just a shame because the guy would have been like a trillionaire in, in 20 century money if he actually managed to get this money invested in the 1750s. And finally, it must not offend against public policy or require any of the trustees to do anything illegal or criminal or more. Now, if we think back to what we are told about this trust by holiday, um, the record of the organ should not fall into unworthy hands. And specifically, the trust forbids that the company copied or published. That's all the holiday says. Dallas told me about it. Now these were originally ticks and crosses, I'm sorry, I was doing this on a map, which has obviously interfered. But living human beneficiary, well, we're going to hold the, hold the films until, until uh, what do you say? Hang on, go back. Until they can't fall into unworthy hands. Well, there's no living beneficiary. Conceptually certain, well, I can come to you and say, my hands are worthy, but can you prove that in law? No, so they're not conceptually certain. Does it offend against the rule of perpetuities? Well, yes, because it doesn't say they can be released at a certain date. It doesn't mention that at all. The only thing it doesn't do is say you've got to drop your trousers and follow you say or whatever. So it doesn't offend against public policy, but it does break three of the laws on the trust, which means that if there ever was a trust, um, it cannot be held valid in law. Okay? Dr. McRae's will, as we already mentioned, makes no mention of the dispersal of any films amongst his heirs. So if the photographer had no direct descendants, he willed the films to no one, there's no legal trust. All the alleged trustees are already dead. No, none of them record any successors having been appointed to run this trust. Who owns any films that Dr. McRae might have shot? Well, there is, in fact, a legal answer to this question. Um, I have closed my file on this subject. Well, like John, I'm moving on. But if anyone wants to take up the mantle, um, I will now reveal to whom you should direct your inquiries. Move on. Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> that is the legal owner of the McRae monster film shot in Lock Dewey in 1935, if such a thing actually exists. I thank you. I've been trying to get Dr. Mike here to come to the weird weekend for about six years. And it's lovely that we've finally got him here. He is a peerless researcher, and I seriously recommend his book all around. I believe we've got a couple of copies for sale yeah. out of the school, and if they all go, I believe there's actually a copy on Bob and Sid's second hand school as well. And I'm sure we'll sign it for you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mike Dash. <laughs> okay, guys, a couple of announcements. There is a delicious soup next door. It is very delicious, and the ladies have worked very hard making it. So I'd be very, very, very suggestive for you all to go and have some lunch. We've got a half hour break, we're running a little bit late, but nothing we can't handle. Half hour break, lunch, followed by the stuff that we're doing, stuff for the kids, the Manhattan's Tea Party. We have large amounts of free cake eating competition. We have all sorts of wonderful talks, all sorts of wonderful things happening. David, music, if you please. <laughs>